My guest today is Peter Baldis, Managing Director of Pragmaxis LLC, a niche consulting group that specializes in assisting clients with their strategic innovation and sourcing initiatives. In this segment, Peter and I will be discussing key trends and learnings about the rise of the Asian consumer, a major shift in the structure of global business and a source of both new opportunities and new risks in global commerce. Welcome, Peter. Can you please provide a brief background of yourself? Thank you, Dustin. It's great to be here with you again. I have been a consultant for nearly 30 years now, uh, specializing in strategic innovation management and focusing on two primary areas for driving strategic innovation. Uh, first, identifying emerging new markets, and closely related to that from an operational perspective, strategic sources and supply chain transformation. I help clients accelerate the definition and execution of core strategic growth initiatives and customer fulfillment capabilities. My education includes an undergraduate degree from MIT in chemical engineering, completion of the University of Chicago Executive Program in Finance and Strategy, and I also hold professional certification as a master business innovator from the Illinois Institute of Technology. My clients are varied in terms of their size and the industries in which they compete, but most are mid- to large-scale firms with global operations spread across multiple industrial segments, including manufacturing, chemicals, energy, and electronics. I've also done some significant recent engagements for clients in the food and beverage and financial services segments, and I'm currently also working with a couple of leading private equity firms that are in multiple domain markets. Prior to founding Pragmaxis in 2001, I held senior practice leadership positions with KPMG, CSE Index, and Booz Allen and Hamilton. Our interview today is on the topic of the rise of the Asian consumer. How would you characterize this new dynamic, and why do you feel it is occurring? There is a new megatrend in the global economy. It's the rise of the Asian consumer, particularly in China and India. It's a story that will play out over the next several decades and promises to have at least as dramatic an impact on the world as the rise of the American consumer in the post-war era of the 1950s. It has huge implications for companies, both within Asia as well as foreign multinationals, for investors and for governments, not to mention the consumers themselves. The rise of Asian economies over the past 50 years, which began with the Japanese in the 1950s, then spread to Korea, Taiwan, and Singapore, and later to the rest of Southeast Asia, with China and India taking the lead since the 1980s, has been mainly a story of production, not consumption. With the notable exception of India, Asia's rising prosperity has been largely driven by an export-oriented economic model. Asia has been the world's biggest factory, a gigantic, increasingly integrated production machine, churning out everything from toys and textiles and tchotchkes to electronics, engineered products, and automobiles. For the last 50 years, the United States and Europe have voraciously consumed what Asia has produced. In the process, Asian countries have run virtually uninterrupted trade and current account surpluses. America, by contrast, has run deficits that have ballooned in recent years. Between 2003 and 2008, for instance, the U.S. current account deficit averaged $700 billion, equal to around 5% of GDP. Almost half of the U.S. trade deficit was with the countries of East Asia. In short, America has been the main consumption engine and Asia the main production engine for the global economy. How is this dynamic changing? Well, this dynamic is changing in a very major way. Asia's growing prosperity, especially since the 1980s, when the Chinese economy started to take off, has been a major impetus behind this change. Asia's pro-export policies, essentially low wages, freedom from environmental and safety regulations, and cheap currencies, are becoming increasingly obsolete and unsuitable. This has become increasingly evident after the global financial crisis of 2008 and 9. The roughly 3.7 billion consumers in Asia now account for more than half of the world's population, but less than 30% of global GDP. In China, the most populous country, 
Consumption as a proportion of GDP is about 35%, among the lowest in the world, compared to 65% in the United States. Asia's underperforming consumers is what makes economists believe that if the world economy is to have a new consumption engine, then outside economic interests guiding a developing Asia must be a big portion of it. The key to the Asian consumer story is the rise of the middle class. According to a seminal study by economist Homi Karas published in 2010, if we define a global middle class as those living in households with daily per capita incomes of around $10 to $100 per day in local parity purchasing, then Asia accounts for roughly 28% of the world's middle class today. By 2020, that share could double. And by 2030, fully two-thirds of the world's middle class will be in Asia. As income levels rise to a point that approaches those of the developed world, consumers tend to gravitate towards international brand name goods. Middle class Chinese consumers in particular show a preference for international brands in their discretionary and luxury goods. This is, however, not true in the case of essential goods and services, where locally branded items do as well or better. Chinese consumers are also increasingly showing a preference for higher-end foods and beverages, both of which are likely to remain fast-growing industries in China for decades to come, not only in large cities, but even in third- and fourth-tier towns. A notable trend among Indian consumers, according to the survey, is that they tend to spend proportionately more on education than others, around 7.5% of total average income. They also exhibit a relatively high degree of sophistication in their savings behaviors. The penetration of banking and insurance is quite high compared with other emerging economies. And unlike elsewhere, most consumers have a bank account. Simple forms of mobile banking using cellular phones are also spreading across India at a rapid rate, enabling innovative new business and payment models. Increases in incomes will change patterns of consumption. The experience of developed economies over the last century suggests that as incomes grow, the proportion of income spent on food and other essential items declines, while that spent on useful and discretionary items increases. However, while this is broadly true, it won't happen at the same pace everywhere. There are important variations between countries, and therefore a more detailed examination of consumption trends and aspirations is needed. What is China's role in all of this? China's role in driving global demand isn't shaped so much by the size of its internal GDP as by its demand for imports. Household consumption as a share of GDP has fallen since the late 1990s from over 55% to just 35% in 2012. This reflects income transfers from households to firms, primarily state-owned uh, enterprises, that yield enormous economic power. Driving domestic consumption-driven growth is as much of a challenge of uncertain politics as it is of economics. But the key is shifting spending power away from these enterprises and back to the consumer. In general, while China is a major importer of parts and components, it is mostly for final assembly of products such as consumer and electronics, plastics for exports to more developed external markets. Internal Chinese segments still represent underdeveloped major markets for the region's manufacturers. Thus, for China to become a sustainable growth engine, it would need to raise its domestic consumption as a proportion of GDP by at least 50%, including imports of final goods from the region. Also, China's currency under evaluation by as much as 30%, according to some estimates, is disputed by its government. But as, Chinese, as the China's yuan gains strength against the dollar and European currencies, other Asian countries will be more comfortable allowing their currencies to rise as well. This will help fuel a consumption boom in the region. What are the population dynamics, and how is that driving the shifting econ economics towards Asia? The overall long-term macro trend is clear. With the region's growing population and increased incomes, 40% of total global consumer spending is expected to come from Asia by 2030, up from around 20% today. Beyond China, a more integrated ASEAN economic community is a key part of the shift, with a projected population of 650 million by 2020, half under the age of 30. 
Emerging Asia's middle-class households with annual disposable incomes between five and 15,000 are expected to increase by more than 150% by 2020. But most of this growth will be at the low end of the middle-class range. Average annual household income in Asia is projected to still be only around $6,000 by 2020, as compared to closer to $40,000 in developed countries. The vast majority of the populations of emerging Asia will continue to be low income and lower middle income for the foreseeable future. Fragmented markets, a high proportion of rural population, and growing income inequality will all conspire to hinder discretionary consumer spending. Still, the emerging Chinese and Asian markets represent considerable business opportunities for international businesses. So what should global corporations be thinking about now? Well, that's a great question, Dustin. For most firms, the challenge is not just to export, but to strengthen the capacity for innovative responsiveness to consumers in emerging Asian market segments. The nature of Asia and its emerging markets suggests a broader perspective on innovation. Benefits of innovation may be captured anywhere along the value chain, from development of new technologies to changes in marketing and distribution systems. Especially in China, smaller enterprises and adapting existing technology to local user needs may be the most accessible route to commercially viable innovation for Asian markets. Investments in early interactions with potential customers on product development, process improvement, and new types of business models can play a central role in shaping innovation and commercializing new ideas. This is especially important for markets where consumers with high aspirations but limited disposable income and constraints not found in developed economies may look for products at relatively low cost with fewer features and more tailored to local user conditions. There are examples, particularly from India and China, of successful innovations for emerging markets and beyond. For example, First Energy's Orgia Stove, developed originally for rural India, is a low-cost, low-smoke, highly efficient stove powered by rechargeable batteries with pellets from organic biofuel derived from processed agricultural waste. It is now being widely marketed across Southeast Asia. China's Galantz developed a microwave oven that is simple, energy efficient, low cost, small, and flexible for local needs, with novel applications for stir frying, deep frying, and steam cooking. Built on local success, it's now being used for expanding global exports. In India and China, GE developed ultrasound and electrocardiogram machines specifically to meet income, infrastructure, and service constraints found in emerging Asia. They also now have found lucrative U.S. niche markets for almost identical products. What do you see as the key to competition in these rapidly emerging markets? Well, taking advantage of Asian emerging market opportunities requires a firm-wide commitment to innovation-led growth. Most corporations hold enormous potential for innovation reflected in their capacity for sophisticated strategic marketing and globally produced products. But exploiting this potential for international markets almost invariably requires what I would call strengthening the internal corporate innovation system, the internal and external collaborative networks of creative thinkers, paradigm shifters, status quo challengers, change agents, and commercialization experts. From an executive perspective, corporations need to ensure that governance models enable these innovators to interact effectively through the implementation of corporate policies, institutions, and programs designed to foster and sustain market-leading innovation. This involves not only needed investment in cutting-edge R&D, but also addressing existing gaps, such as financing for early-stage innovation and supporting external infrastructure, such as innovation parks, which have been highly successful in Asia. Considerable payoffs can come from innovation all along the value chain, including from investment in areas such as user-oriented product development and new types of marketing, sales, and distribution models. Do you see any shifts in the way that strategic innovation needs to be managed in Asia? At most companies today, there is likely to be more internal innovation on going to market strategies and thinking about new business opportunities than there is on technical innovation. 
technical innovation generally lags behind market and product innovation in maturity as a driver of business growth, but in the case of China, represents a significant source of long-term strategic business advantage. One note of caution. What China does better than any place in the world is to innovate through commercialization as opposed to innovation through iterative R&D. Perfecting the theory, we like to tend, you know, as we do in the West. When the Chinese get an idea, they test it in the marketplace. In the West, we test it in the lab. The Chinese are happy to do three or four rounds of commercialization to get an idea right, whereas we in the West spend about the same amount of time doing internal research, testing, and validation before trying to bring products to market. While the Chinese may have more improvements to go, they'll work on them in parallel with finding out what the customer really likes and how they use the innovation. The difference is that by the time a Western company rolls out their introductory product or service, their domestic Chinese competition may already have a two- to three-year head start in a commanding market position. That is an innovative way of doing innovation, something that the rest of the world is struggling to understand. Thank you, Peter. For more information on this topic or to contact Peter Balbus directly, please visit www.pragmaxis.com. That's spelled P-R-A-G-M-A-X-I-S. That's P-R-A-G-M-A-X-I-S. Thank you.